So finally, joining us to round out our first day, we're going to hear from representatives of Reich Swan about breeding, in this case, gherkins for different markets. With us today, we have Sam McGovern, product development specialist, and Joe Benson, who is the Florida Farm Station Manager. So Sam and Joe, I will hand it over to you. My name is Joe Benson, and I'm the station manager for Reich Swan. Our farm is located in a small community called Felda, which is about 11 miles northeast from the city of Immokalee. Our current crop portfolio is gherkin, watermelon, bell pepper, squash, radish, spinach, broccoli, cabbage, kale, iceberg and romaine lettuce, Swiss chard, and cantaloupe. Florida is very warm, rainy, and humid. This type of weather makes for high disease and insect pressures here in the south, and it makes it very difficult to preserve our crops here on the farm. We breed for these challenges, so finding the right balance is often a difficult task in our breeding work. Breeding in South Florida is important and necessary in that it, companies like ours can develop vegetable varieties that resist disease, insect pests, weather extremes, along with other environmental factors. Florida is one of the most important growing regions in North America for our winter vegetables. Breeding in general improves the quality, flavor, and shelf life of our food. It makes positive improvements for people everywhere. Breeding also offers varieties that allow people to eat their favorite vegetables any time during the year. My name is Sam McGowan, and I'm a gherkin crop specialist for Reich Swan USA and I'm based out of Goldsboro, North Carolina and covering the southern half of the United States. My colleague Rob Gross is based out of Ontario and covers the northern U.S. and Canada. The word gherkin has a lot of different meanings depending on what part of the world that you're in, but we use it simply to refer to any pickling type cucumber. There are many different types of gherkin hybrids on the market. Reichswan hybrids are parthenocarpic, have excellent fresh and brined quality, and offer high yields to the grower. Parthenocarpy means the ability of a plant to set fruit without pollination, and parthenocarpic varieties eliminate the need for bees and for male pollinizer seed. Without having to worry about pollination, we also don't have to worry about the weather being suitable for pollinator flight, which can be a big advantage to growers. Parthenocarpic varieties have higher yield potential, better shape, and a firmer seed cavity. The fact that they don't get pollinated means that there's no seed, which can be an advantage to the quality also. Within our portfolio, we have a wide selection of hybrids, which are suited to different growing styles and different conditions. Our gherkin varieties are used successfully in hand harvest and machine harvest programs. And in fact, some growers have found that a successful program can be to go in initially and hand harvest a field and then clean up with the machine harvester after regrowth. After gherkins are harvested, they go through a grading process to separate by size and remove any coals. After that, the pads begin to diverge depending on what type of pickle they're destined to become. The first distinction is between fresh pack versus processed. Fresh pack pickles go straight to the processing line while fresh and will be preserved by either pasteurization or refrigeration. Processed pickles go into a brine tank to be preserved for later use. These are sometimes called brined or fermented type pickles. Traditionally, fermentation was the only way to preserve pickles before refrigeration and pasteurization became common alternatives. Fermentation is still used commonly today because it allows the gherkins to be stored in bulk while waiting to be packed, and it also provides a different flavor profile that some consumers prefer. During fermentation, the gherkins are submerged in a salty brine, which favors the action of specific microorganisms. The gherkins undergo fermentation, which turns the sugars in the gherkin into lactic acid. The combination of lactic acid and salt preserves the pickled gherkins for later use. 
Beyond the simple difference in preservation method, there are many, many different ways to turn a gherkin into a value-added product. If we think in terms of walking down the pickle aisle in the grocery store, your bread and butter items and kosher deals are examples of fresh pack products, whereas hamburger dill chips and relish are examples of some fermented products. Oftentimes people see pickles as just a sandwich condiment, and it's true that over half of the pickles Americans consume each year are consumed with a sandwich. But there's a huge assortment in the pickle world. A pickle is not just a pickle. There is a pickle for just about any flavor profile. Sweet, salty, garlic, sour, hot, sweet and hot. And then on top of these various flavor options, there are different sizes and different cuts. Spears, stackers, chunks, chips, and slices. With all this variety, pickle processors take a single crop, gherkins, and make literally hundreds of unique products. I don't know of any other vegetable with so much variety in the finished product line. We try to stay in frequent contact with the folks using our varieties so that we can provide technical support and try to provide proactive suggestions for any growing challenges. We are all learning together. There's not a one-size-fits-all recipe for successful gherkin production. Every year seems to throw in a new challenge with different weather, so it's important that we're always learning in order to build a better variety and a better growing program for the future. The most important consideration when helping a grower select a variety is making sure that they'll be able to sell what they produce. So we have to provide a variety that is suited for the length and quality requirements of their particular processor. Secondly, we shoot for something that will stand up to their growing environment, growing practices, harvest practices, and something that gives the best overall yield. It's a big puzzle to put together, and since you never know what a given season will bring, it's usually best to have more than one variety in the program. As seed suppliers, we're at the start of a long supply chain focused on one goal, delivering quality pickles to the consumer. If the product doesn't suit the end user, it doesn't matter what we can offer the grower from a yield standpoint. Similarly, if the quality is there with a particular hybrid, but it doesn't have the agronomic traits for the grower to produce it profitably, then the whole chain falls apart. We're constantly involving the growers and processors in the search for a better pickle so that we can make sure we're steering the ship in the right direction. Pickles have always been one of my favorite foods, and in fact, I liked them so much as a kid that one year I got a gallon jar of fresh kosher dills for Christmas. But right now, my top shelf in my refrigerator is covered with an assortment of different pickles, but I'd have to say my favorite is just the classic fermented dill hard to beat. Thanks, Sam and Joe. Great presentation. Um, I'll have you come up and join me for the Q&A. Welcome. Thanks, Beth. Hello. Great. Um, we actually have a we have a question here waiting. Um, can you talk more about the parthenocarpic trait? Is that something available to home gardeners? Sure. Yeah, parthenocarpi is just a genetic trait that's found naturally in the um, cucumber genome worldwide, and it's been put into our commercial hybrids through traditional breeding methods, and it it simply allows the plant to set fruit without needing to be pollinated. Um, traditionally, most cucumber varieties or gherkin varieties that have been on the market have required pollination to set fruit. And with Parthenocarpi, that's not necessary. And this trait is available to home gardeners. There are many varieties, um, some of our right swan varieties included, that are sold in seed catalogs. And so they are available for sure. Some of the ones that I see most often of our varieties in the home garden seed catalogs are Puccini um, and sometimes Bernstein, if you're just, you know, those are two names that you may come, 
come across in some of the common home garden catalogs? Great, thank you. Another question, how many gherkins are grown in the U.S. and in what regions? So the data that the USDA tracks is the combination of all cucumbers, gherkins included, um, and they track about 100,000 acres or a little over 100,000 acres nationally in the U.S. And we estimate that about three quarters of those or a little more are gherkins grown for processing. Uh, regionally, the pickle industry is kind of centered around the Great Lakes region and then also the east coast kind of from delaware south to florida quite a bit grown in florida and uh then the it kind of follows where the processors are so there's large processors around the great lakes and then a few down this way um, and then outside of that that's the core of the industry there's small pockets all over texas and california um, are some of the notable ones Thank you. Can you tell us what the lifespan is of the varieties, um, of your varieties in the field? Yeah, that's a good question. One of the main benefits for parthenocarpic traits in uh, particular, the hand harvest gherkins are the longevity of harvests. Uh, whereas uh, um, just speaking out of examples here in North Carolina, with a traditional seeded variety, a grower would expect five to six picks off of a hand harvest field. And when they move to parthenocarpic to our hybrids, uh, they typically get eight to 10 picks. So uh, it can be as much as double. And uh, in extreme examples, we see some growers getting 20 picks and uh, that's pretty a pretty big boost over, over the traditional seeded varieties. And there are even more extreme examples of where my colleague Rob is based in Ontario. They do special harvest methods where they uh, ride on harvest aids. And so there's very little vine disturbance. And so they might start picking a field at the beginning of July and pick it for um, well over a month on those same vines. So that's a, a huge benefit to parthenocarpic hybrids. Thank you. What do you see as the biggest challenge to breeding gherkins today? And then going along with that, where do you see opportunities? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, certainly disease is a big challenge. Our biggest disease problem in, in gherkins is downy mildew. And downy mildew is um, anywhere where you have a lot of moisture and humidity pretty much. And so it's a it's a huge problem in our major production areas, and uh, the disease evolves fairly rapidly. So we have a lot of fungicides that ten years ago um, were highly effective on downy mildew, and now are not effective at all. Um, so it, it tends to stay ahead of the fungicide cycle with resistance. So. A big uh, goal and a big challenge in breeding is breeding in that downy mildew resistance. And at the same time, we want to bring in the downy mildew resistance without taking out any other beneficial traits like yield. So balancing all of those things is definitely a big challenge. Definitely. So do you have any advice for home gardeners looking to grow cucumbers for pickling? What should they look for when selecting varieties? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, of course, there's a lot of options out there. I think that parthenocarpic varieties are a big uh, benefit for home gardeners. And part of the reason why is that in a very small planting like you typically have in a home garden, you might not have enough space that you want to dedicate any of it to pollinizer plants um, to bring in that male flower. So if you're going to have hybrids, it really helps to have parthenocarpic hybrids where you don't need to dedicate that extra space to um, pollinizers and where you don't have to worry about the pollination um, occurring. So I think that that's a big thing to look for. And 
Another thing that can typically help in a limited space environment and where you really want to get as much production out of one plant as possible is trellising or, you know, having a support for the uh, cucumbers to climb on that can really help extend the life of that plant and um, get some more production out of it. It's really helpful. Thank you. Um, well, we're waiting for a few more questions to come in. I'll ask you a um, question that I've asked the others. How has COVID impacted your operations, um, either your breeding programs, labor, or any other challenges that you've experienced? Joe, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I'll take that. Just like uh, speakers mentioned, we have challenges here, but uh, for the most part, the farm's been open and the company's very cognizant of uh, giving us the resources to uh, be able to fall within the code requirements. Uh, for example, uh, some of the engineering controls we have on our office are like uh, uh, UV on our inlet air conditioner. Uh, we still wear face masks, um, but that helps with uh, virus. And then we use a lot of the, the tools. Uh, Emily Powwow, who's a, a uh, colleague of mine here, she works closely with the crops and the breeders. She uses a lot of FaceTime, uh, phone calls, and, and then meeting with dealers out in the field, uh, social distancing. Uh, manageable, but it does pose some challenges for us. But we seem to pretty well here at the farm. Most of the rest of the folks are working from home just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, that's, that's good to hear. Any other questions from the, from the group? Well, Joe and Sam, do you have any, any final words, anything else that you want to share with the group? Well, I'll mention that, uh, this is a very challenging environment here in South Florida. I, uh, grew up in the Salinas Valley out in California. And I uh, did most of my farming uh, under a research umbrella for 32 years over there. And I've been here for about five years. And this is a great place to, to, to do breeding in for our varieties. Uh, like Sam said, downy mildew. On, and the pressure here is very high, so it gives us the ability to screen and develop resistance in those varieties. One thing I learned when I came here to uh, something's, if you turn around, something's happened. It's a very, very uh, harsh environment. Definitely. Um, I, I got one more question in. How has consumer demand changed over the years and how are you working through breeding to meet that demand? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, of course, pickles have been around a long, long time and uh, I think for the most part, pickles are still pickles, but um, the industry has innovated in a lot of ways on the you know, offerings to retail consumers. There's a lot more variety now than I think there was even five years ago um, from different flavors and now different um, convenience items. Convenience is a big deal with small portable um, packaging and you know, snack size packaging that's been a big deal. And one thing that I think that that has done on the, that's affected the breeding size is we've probably got more demand for small size gherkins now than we did 10 years ago. Um, there's been a lot of the growth in the retail side has been for the baby size or petite size uh, pickles. And so we're looking at different ways to uh, provide varieties that really perform well for harvesting very small grades. And some of that is, of course, it's easier to get small grades off of hand harvest than off of machine harvest. So while machine harvest remains dominant and um, remains a big, big part of our breeding program, we've um, kind of been influenced to take another look at some ways to go for the hand harvest market and particularly hand harvest for small pickles. Um, a lot of that is done on trellis. So we're looking at varieties that climb well and varieties that will stand up for a really, really long time. Uh, since you don't get very many at one time when you're picking for small 
fruit, you have to go in again and again and again. And um, disease resistance is a big part of that. And just production over a very long period of time is a big part of that. And uh, of course, this is hopefully a one time thing. But another thing I'll just add is that COVID um, certainly affected demand at one time for food service versus retail. And I think we've seen a lot of that bounce back, but in the pickle industry, food service, it's mostly large sizes that are going to be cut up to go on, you know, burgers and sandwiches or go to deli spears. And uh, there's been a lot of whiplash <laughs> on that end with COVID as there has been for the whole food supply chain. But um, it's just been interesting to see how a shock like that can affect demand of something like pickles. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. Well, so that wraps up day one. I want to thank you both for joining us and um, sharing your insight on Gherkins. Um, great discussion. And thank you to all of you and the audience um, for, for tuning in. Um, my, I'm going to have my contact information on the screen and feel free to send in any questions that you may not have thought of, but hopefully you'll, we can be back to join us here tomorrow, same place, same time, where we're going to hear from Bayer on a collaborative approach to breeding peppers for growers and consumers, Syngenta on leveraging watermelon germplasm diversity for diverse markets. And we'll hear from the lead of the University of Florida's Citrus Research Program to discuss um, innovations like gene editing and the future of plant breeding. So we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks everyone and have a great rest of the day.